Hello, everyone. We have gathered today for a special discussion on the Russia-Ukraine war and its lessons for Northeast Asia. Today's panel ex explores the geopolitical and economic implications for Northeast Asia, what North Korea, China, and the United States may learn from the invasion, and whether a similar conflict could occur on the Korean Peninsula or in Taiwan. We have four distinguished speakers joining us. Sheena Greitens, who is currently an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on American national security, East Asia, and authoritarian politics and foreign policy. Youngjin Kim is a professor of the National Security College and a director of Center for Northeast Asian Affairs and Center for North Korean Affairs at Research Institute for National Security Affairs of the Korean National Defense University. He is also a member of the National Security Advisory Board for the President's Office of the Republic of Korea. Stephen Lee Myers is the Beijing Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Previously, he was a correspondent in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. Before then, he worked as a Bureau Chief in Moscow, covering Russia and the other former Soviet republics. He is the author of a bi biography of Vladimir Putin, The New Tsar. Finally, Mason Ritchie is Asia Society Korea's senior contributor and an associate professor of international politics at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. His research focuses on U.S. and European foreign and security policy as applied to the Asia Pacific. Steve, I would like to start uh, this discussion with you. Given your knowledge of Putin's Russia, were you surprised by the invasion of Ukraine? What do you think are the reasons for Putin's aggression? And what does he hope to achieve from the military offensive? You know, uh, it's a great question, and I could spend an hour talking about it. But the, I, I think everyone was surprised by the scale of the operation, by the scale of the ambition. Uh, he told the French president yesterday that he intends to demilitarize uh, Ukraine and, and occupy it. And he, he thinks right now that the... the uh, plan is is going according to schedule, uh, which is not the narrative I think many people watching from the outside see. Um, that said, despite the surprise that everyone felt, uh, this has been brewing for at least two decades, really since he took office. And you could even say before uh, that, uh, because of his own personal uh, connections with Ukraine and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, and certainly as president, he always felt like he needed to restore Russia, not to the Soviet Union. I don't think he's trying to recreate that, um, but to, to maybe even something older, you know, the, the Russian Empire. And he believes that Ukraine, at, like Belarus, like parts of the Baltics, uh, even Kazakhstan, uh, are essentially Russian lands, uh, even though there may be ethnic differences and so forth, and that, that those need to be or remain under, under Russia's influence. So if you go back to the first Orange Revolution, one of the um, public protests that gave the name Color Revolutions that everyone talks about now, in 2004, um, he treated that then as an uh, uh, existential threat to the Russian state. Um, and ever since then, through the, the war with Georgia, um, the, the conflict in 2014, the annexation of Crimea, this has clearly been on his mind. Uh, and I think what surprised everybody is that he'd be willing to be so reckless in launching uh, a, essentially an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine at this point. Well, the response from the West and its allies have, has been strong and unified, and Western leaders were preparing themselves for all different scenarios before the war broke out. But were they really ready for this? And do you think Russia is surprised by this unified response? I think it, there's, it, Russia is very much surprised by it. And the consequences, uh, I think, uh, is, is what Putin miscalculated, um, you know, the, the actions against Swift, um, you know, Ikea pulled out and I can't even begin to tell you how popular Ikea is in Russia. Um, huge lines there, as it is in most places. Um, but the idea that these uh, global companies that that are pulling out that Russia is essentially collapsing in on itself um, is, is going to have a catastrophic influence uh, or impact on, on the people of Russia, uh, as well as the businesses there. Um, and I think that 
and I'm projecting a little bit, but Putin probably calculated that after he annexed Crimea, another violation of international law, he, he certainly faced sanctions and some isolation, uh, but not a significant one, not, a, not one so painful that he couldn't endure it. And so I think he probably calculated that there would be another round of this um, that would follow any military action in Ukraine. Um, he just probably did not anticipate that it would be as unified and as sweeping as it's proving to be. Thank you. And she and Putin have maintained close relationship, close enough for she to call Putin an old friend. And they have been working together to weaken American power and influence in Asia. However, China is also in an awkward position at the moment, and the rest of Asia is struggling to balance relations with the U.S., Russia, and China right now. Sheena, what kind of strategic dilemma is China in as a result of this war? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, what we've seen from China is that just as Putin appears to have been surprised by some of the effects of uh, his choice to to launch this invasion at the scale that, that he chose to do it at. Um, you know, I think Xi Jinping has been caught off guard. Now, we don't know exactly what was said in early February between the two leaders, what the discussion was, um, but it's possible that the message that was delivered was very much in line with what Russia's expectations were about the conflict, that it would be short, that it would be, you know, very not particularly difficult, um, and that this would be sort of, you know, business as, as usual after a short period. Um, and so I think what we've seen is a China that's been a little bit on its back foot trying to figure out how to square um, its relationship with Russia with international reaction. But I, I think, um, you know, we've seen that in some of the language, the hedging, the refusal to, to answer a, a direct question about whether or not this is an invasion, um, the appeal to or reference to legitimate security interests, and then sort of having to dance around uh, the, the fact that that appears only to apply to Russia and not, not necessarily to Ukraine. Um, so I think what, you know, what, we've, what we've seen is um, China sort of trying to figure out how to use it, the principles that it normally frames its foreign policy in and apply them to a situation where there are just some pretty direct contradictions um, in what China is, is trying to do. Um, and so the result of that has been this sort of tortured rhetoric um, at the same time as in practice, a, a sort of pro-Russian lean has become, I think, increasingly clear. I'd be curious what the other panelists make of, of that. Um, but I think, you know, when you look at um, the behavior in the UN, yes, there's there's abstention. But if you look at, at comments about sanctions and um, from some of the economic activity, um, I think it's it's uh, China is trying to figure out essentially how to square this strategic partnership um, and in particular how to sort of maintain that relationship. Um, and and a relationship that it thinks is strategically and geopolitically important, while not compromising its access to the global market economy, which it, it needs to continue, um, you know, a, a sort of a healthy economic trajectory. Um, and, and it's it's not clear to me how exactly those two are going to be reconcilable, given the scale of the international reaction. Um, so I, I do think China uh, is is a little bit on its back foot, but but all that said, I think the the tilt toward Russia has become increasingly clear as this has played out. Great, Mason. There have been a number of news reports about the concerns on Taiwan and how its people have been preparing for the worst. And although China might be thinking about what lessons can be applied to Taiwan. China has also witnessed the aftermath of the Ukraine invasion. Regardless, what are the possibilities that China will find a reason to invade Taiwan? Does Taiwan have strong enough military and will the United States be committed to defend them? Um, so, you know, I think that there are, uh, an, you know, at this stage, which is of course very, um, uh, incomplete. Um, you know, it looks like we're in early days um, of something that might stretch out for quite some time. So drawing definitive conclusions is obviously um, uh, difficult and, and a bit risky, but I think there are, you know, in theory, some some early lessons. Um, and I think one of the, the first ones uh, is that it is um, 
very difficult to successfully attack uh, a country which is motivated to defend itself, uh, which has had some time to prepare itself, uh, and which uh, you know has at least some of the, or in some cases, a lot of the the weapons and the capabilities uh, in order to engage in that sort of resistance. Uh, in some sense, this shouldn't be a new lesson. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the Soviet Union you know, already learned that in Afghanistan. Uh, the United States learned that in Afghanistan. Uh, the United States learned that in Iraq. Um, so in some sense, this shouldn't be a new lesson. But you know, interestingly, I think, um, you know, from what we can gather uh, in looking at the way that, that Russia has carried out its tactics in Ukraine so far, it looks like Russia expected to go into Ukraine and for Ukraine to fall apart and essentially not to have to engage in the type of fighting that it looks like Putin says he's now willing to engage in, um, including you know, shelling civilian areas um, and eventually what could turn into something um, for which I think we're not also in the Western world or, or, or in the democratic liberal world prepared, which could be you know, some on the ground troop massacres um, of people in cities, um, of civilians, uh, and some things that are going to become extremely ugly. Uh, I don't think Putin was necessarily ready for that. In fact, I think they weren't ready for that, looking at the tactics that they've engaged in. And if I were she, uh, or if I were if I were Kim in North Korea, uh, you know, I would hope at least that I would have advisors around me. Uh, who, who would be honest with me and tell me, OK, if I have some plan in the back of my head, you know, when I'm drunk in the evening one night and I think about, you know, you know, my geopolitical plans for the future, uh, you know, that might in include uh, trying to in invade Taiwan or parts of Taiwan or some of the islands in the in the strait, uh, or if I would be interested in trying to take a part of, of South Korea, I, I would hope that I would have advisors around me who would who would remind me of what Putin is experiencing now, which is that a motivated uh, you know, a motivated um, population uh, under attack um, can be remarkably effective uh, at making any victory pyrrhic. Uh, so I think, you know, at least on the surface, you would say that this would, would I think, really militate towards, you know, China looking at, at Taiwan not as an object uh, for, uh, for attack uh, in this type of, of sense, that rather they would use other forms of trying to wear down and coerce Taiwan into to some type of uh, capitulation uh, over time, and presumably the same thing uh, with respect to, to North Korea. Um, now, as for Taiwan's defenses, you know, I, you know, I'm personally not an expert in Taiwan, so I should probably you know let someone else answer that question. But but at least from from what I gather and from what I've read. You know, Taiwan's kind of a mixed bag. They have some capabilities uh, which would uh, probably not be very useful uh, in creating what we call a hedgehog strategy to sort of you know, make it a, a difficult country to swallow, uh, so to speak, if China were to try to, to launch some type of invasion at some point in the future. Uh, so I think that their capabilities are a mixed bag. And I think there's an open question as to how capable they're going to be of uh, you know, reforming and making the right types of uh, defense procurement decisions. Um, I can only imagine that the U.S. Uh, will be in conversation with Taiwan about this if they have not already been uh, about uh, these types of capability procurements going forward. Uh, I think another thing that's uh, probably a, a, a good lesson to, to, re to recall if you are China or North Korea uh, or, or as well as any other country is that, of course, you know, Ukraine is not a treaty ally of the United States. So the United States is not obligated uh, to come to Ukraine's defense in the same way that it would be for a NATO country if Article 5 of the Washington Treaty were to be activated. And in the case of Taiwan, of course, we have uh, a policy of you know, strategic ambiguity where it's, you know, in some sense, intentionally left unclear as to exactly what the United States would do in this type of situation. But, you know, certainly, you know, that would have to give pause to Xi. And of course, in the case of South Korea, they are a treaty ally of the United States, which I think, you know, obviously increases the level of deterrence um, uh, much more dramatically. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, I've heard China experts, many of whom I, I really respect, uh, essentially make an argument that, you know, it's not really in China's uh, interest and it's not really in the cards that she has or that the CCP has 
uh, to engage in this type of uh, invasion um, uh, that we see in Ukraine in, in Taiwan, for instance. And arguably, you could say the same thing about uh, North Korea coming into South Korea. You know, the argument being that in some sense, you know, you're, uh, you're invading your brothers, Right. And so part of the logic of, of, of Putin here was precisely that he wouldn't have to engage in this type of you know, aggressive um, scorched earth policy. Uh, and that you know, the idea would be that she or Kim wouldn't be interested in doing that in Taiwan or South Korea because the, you know, those are brother populations and, and rather there are other coercive means uh, that you can uh, engage in in order to try to, to, to wear down uh, your object of, uh, uh, of, of coercion. I think in some sense, you know, Putin's indicated, first of all, we should always remember that leaders can miscalculate <laughs> and they can make mistakes. Uh, and secondly, that, you know, when worse comes to worse, uh, it seems like uh, it is possible for leaders, particularly, I would argue, perhaps personalist dictators uh, to engage in this type of um, highly aggressive behavior against people who we wouldn't otherwise think that they would be willing to engage in this type of behavior. And I guess in the very last thing I would say is um, I'm not entirely certain um, in talking about miscalculation that that's uh, entirely the right term. I, I think that's part of it. But I, I wouldn't discount the fact, frankly speaking, that, that something is going on with Putin in terms of his mental state. I'm not 100 percent convinced that he's 100 uh, percent of sound mind. Um, that's purely speculation, of course. But, you know, regardless of, of whether or not he is or isn't of sound mind, you know, the information environment in which he operates, which presumably is something kind of similar to the information environment in which, you know, other personalist dictators such as uh, she or, or Kim operate in makes it very difficult, I think, for them to make good decisions because the, the information, the briefs that they're given uh, are likely skewed because of the incentives uh, in those political structures. Okay, we'll come back to what you just talked about. But uh, in the meantime, Young Jun, we're now five days away from the 20th presidential election here in South Korea. And there has been a great concern about the fact that the two main presidential candidates lack foreign policy experience. experience. As a matter of fact, they have suffered setbacks over rather insensitive or inappropriate comments related to the Ukraine crisis. Another candidate, Shim Sang Jong, expressed her concern that South Korea can be the Ukraine of Asia when some strategic balance in Northeast Asia collapses. Now, Young Jun, you've been serving on the Blue House's National Security Advisory Board. What would be the most important thing for the new president elect to ensure the peace and balance in the Korean Peninsula? Yes, uh, as you know, South Korean people are usually don't interest in uh, European issue, especially Russian conflict with the Eastern Europe. Uh, when the uh, climate uh, annexation, not South Korean people uh, talk about that, that issue too much. And um, uh, surprisingly, South Korean people has no opinion on uh, Putin's uh, dictatorship or authoritarian issue. But uh, this time, Ukraine issue is uh, one of the, the main uh, debate a topic uh, among South Korea because of the it is an implication for the Korean Peninsula. Uh, yes, you, you, you already said about the uh, presidential uh, candidate uh, using this situation for their own uh, the uh, uh, policy uh, the, for the uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, as you know, the uh, uh, the Yoon Song Yeol opposition candidate uh, uh, strengthen lock U.S. alliances and the possibility of the North Korean invasion, even Chinese invasion of the Korean Peninsula. That's why we have to uh, prepare for the uh, the kind of uh, invasion uh, with the uh, strong deterrence issue and with the uh, lock U.S. alliance uh, system. Uh, but at the same time, Lee Jae Myung or Shim Sang Jung is a uh, 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 ruling party candidate using this issue for their uh, strengthening on their own issue uh, sounds like the, the Korean Peninsula Peace Process uh, 2.1. Uh, the, uh, they want to uh, strengthen the uh, uh, peacemaking process. That's why we don't uh, need to be Ukraine in North East Asia. So uh, now is South Korea very interested in this issue. Definitely most of them side with Ukraine and blaming uh, Putin. And um, I, I have thought about this issue to the uh, Army, Navy, and 
Air Force officer at the KNDU over the years, and they are not very interested in the uh, European issue, but this time they are very interesting. And I thought about the, who's winner or loser from this game for the long term or short term. Uh, definitely China will be a winner unexpectedly because the US now is have a two front line. They want to focus on the one China issue, but now they have to take care about the European issue as well. So I think is uh, China will be a winner from this game, and Putin uh, will be a, a winner. I think uh, from this uh, own calculation, already Steve said about the uh, uh, political calculation for this issue. Maybe Putin think about all possible scenario from this invasion, and Russian people support him. Uh, now say, for the uh, long-term dictatorship. And Russia will be a loser, but I think uh, Putin will be a winner of this game. And Biden definitely should be a loser for this uh, mid-term election. And um, North Korea, North Korea, how about, I think about Kim Jong-un, I think he'll be a loser as well from this game because uh, definitely now this issue has divided who is uh, in China, Russian side, who is in, in U.S. Lock side. So North Korea definitely clearly in the uh, China Russian side. So other thing is uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula Peace Plus will be uh, main uh, topic or a uh, rock. Uh, DPLK U.S. Uh, presidential talk will be very difficult for a while because of this issue. And um, as you know, Russia and China will have a bus stop exercise in uh, in Bison area this year. So it will be another issue. Maybe this year will be not happening. But anyway, China, Russia military population will be getting stronger and getting closer. So uh, many people, uh, my friend in Washington, D.C., concern about the uh, possible North Korean joining this china Russia military exercise in Nigeria, even Bison area. And is this will be possible in few, a few years, not not this year. But um, so I, I think so. This now a new Cold War situation is definitely strongly influenced on the over the Korean Peninsula, and definitely this block coming uh, presidential election definitely influenced by this issue as well. So Young Jun and Mason, you both talked about North Korea here, and um, I'd like to throw a question for all of you. There will be a transition period for South Korea's leadership between next week and the new president's inauguration in May. And North Korea has resumed the missile tests in the midst of all this. And this is not the best time for the United States, Russia, and China to come up with a coordinated response, which gives Pyongyang to make advancements in its nuclear and missile technology. So, uh, Mason, you did briefly mention it, um, but would it be possible for China to eventually team up with Pyongyang to attack South Korea in the future? Young Jin, um, would you like to give it a shot? I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily think that's likely. I mean, right now, as I said, this is, you know, these are early days from what we're seeing here. So, you know, as I said, drawing definitive conclusions, I think is tough. Um, but, you know, early lessons, you know, in some weird way, I would almost argue that right now, um, Taiwan and, and South Korea, if you want to look at it this way, would, you know, be, let's say, you know, marginally safer, <laughs> I think. I mean, if I'm she or if I'm Kim, I, I look at what's happening in Ukraine and I say, okay, th this probably wouldn't go the way that we would want it to go if we were to try something similar. Um, I think the, the exception to that, um, and it's a scary one with what everything that we're seeing happen right now, is that, you know, in theory, you can imagine a situation where, uh, conflict could spill over uh, and grow. And, you know, Jung Jun just mentioned, you know, a Cold War, you know, it, it does seem like we're sort of trending in a direction where we might be looking at something like a sort of Cold War 2.0 with all of the necessary caveats and, and changes. But, you know, to the extent that we might be moving in that direction, and, you know, we are seeing, you know, I think early, early signs that, that she and China are, uh, you know, at least in some way, even though it's uncomfortable and self-contradictory to some of their own principles, backing Russia in what's happening in Ukraine. Um, you know, you could imagine a scenario, you know, whether it be in Europe, you know, as we're seeing now with, you know, Putin escalating, you know, now in a nuclear fashion, um, 
you know, you can imagine that this sort of, you know, Cold War type of scenario could could lead to spillover, uh, you know, in this region as well. And, you know, in that scenario, uh, if we find, you know, China, North Korea and uh, and uh, Russia uh, cooperating, you know, closely together at some point in the future, you, know, you could imagine that there could be some scenarios where the Korean Peninsula would, would face a crisis where where China might be involved. I mean, obviously, a lot of dominoes would have to fall in a very unfortunate direction. <laughs> um, and so I don't think that that's anywhere near the most likely outcome. Um, but it does seem like we've, you know, accelerated um, a, a move into a, a, an even more pronounced split between, you know, what we used to call the, the liberal uh, world order and whatever it is that's emerging in this sort of, you know, strategic quasi alliance between uh, Russia and China, uh, you know, and it does seem like North Korea is more, more likely than not to keep gravitating uh, towards that direction as well. So, you know, you can't, rule it out you can't turn it you can't you know set the likelihood of this type of situation you know where china might be involved again on the korean peninsula at zero uh but i don't think it's the most likely outcome either sheena do you have any thoughts i know that you have been yeah, I mean, my, expectations are, my expectations are probably more to do with continued missile testing and activity by north korea to advance its own security um, so, you know, I, I think it was uh, useful for North Korea um, and for Pyongyang's purposes to have a missile test during the Olympics. I think there, you know, there was very little chance that China was going to be distracted from hosting the Olympics. And I think it was it they, there was a sort of um, sense in China that the United States was kind of trying to discredit and, and undermine the Olympics. And um, and so, you know, uh, that in essence, I think really provided some kind of sheltering effect for, for Pyongyang um, to go ahead and engage in these missile tests, knowing that China was not going to sort of go out of its way to, to work with the United States in any way to be, um, to be tough. Um, that may or may not have had secondary effects on the China-Russia relationship in these conversations that happened in, in early February. Um, I don't. I just don't think we have the whole story there. Um, but I, you know, I think um, you know. Similarly, times when great powers are distracted create a permissive environment for North Korea. And um, frankly, you know, to advance a, a missile test uh, or a missile program in the ways that the Kim Jong Un has outlined that he would like to do, right? He's sort of publicly laid out a, an agenda for, for the missile program, um, you know, that that's going to require at least some testing. Um, and so I think what we'll expect to see is a combination of, you know, seasonal, technical and political factors combining to shape when North Korea chooses to, to do these tests. So when are the environment, when is the environment politically permissive? When is it technically necessary? When is the weather, you know, appropriate for whatever type of test North Korea needs to do? Um, you know, what's the political calendar in which these tests might be useful for domestic purposes? Um, so I think all four of these, these factors are going to combine um, so, so my expectation has on, on the Korean Peninsula really has more to do with how North Korea will leverage the international environment to keep pursuing goals that it's been pretty clear and consistent about and that it views, I think, as, as necessary for its, its own regime security. Thank you. And the second question that goes to all of you as well, was this Russia-Ukraine war avoidable? And will it be possible for the United States to maintain its position and focus as regional security guarantor? Steve, what do yeah, you think? Of, of, course the, of course the war was in, uh, avoidable, um, but it required uh, the, it, you know, a level of diplomacy that I think that was missing. Um, and you know, Mason alluded to this as well, that you know, I'm not sure that Putin is in the mood for diplomacy right now. And I, I, I would step back a little bit and say that I think what's happening is is on the same level as 9-11 or the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think it's going to rejigger the entire um, you know, world order in some way. Putin is basically saying um, by force he's willing to 
um, defend what he considers his sphere of influence. It's a very kind of old fashioned notion um, uh, that I think a lot of people thought we would, uh, we had gotten beyond, um, but you know, that that's where we are. And I think, I think that in, in Europe, especially, but also in the United States, I think people just misread that, um, that he was willing to go this far. And, and that may be why, um, there, there weren't more actions taken uh, to, to head this off. Um, you know, the Ukrainian president said the other day that, like, he appreciates all the help that he's getting, but why didn't he get it earlier? Uh, that might have sent a clearer message to, to, to Putin at the same time. I, I, I do think that in terms of the reaction, you know, one, one great question, and we don't know, really know the answer, is what did she and Putin say in private about this? And most indications are that Putin did not tell she exactly. And that's why the Chinese government seemed so caught off guard by this. Um, but, you know, they obviously could see what was happening as well, and they didn't really make any moves to act as a mediator or to try to head it off privately with Putin or with others. And so now that I think that's part of the, the challenge of China's position right now. Um, and again, looking forward to this new world order that's going to emerge after this, that um, China's in a position where I don't think they want to be in this axis or this block with Russia and North Korea. Uh, I think they want, they still see themselves, and this is their stated policy, and I think you can take them at face value on this, that they they believe in this multilateral world with, you know, institutions like the UN, um, you know, still governing uh, the world order. I, th- I think we're she and Putin share um, a, a, a worldview is in the notion that it's the United States that has upended that order by its wars of choice and so forth, um, by its exertion of military power and economic influence through sanctions and so on. So I think that the, um, you know, it, China probably could have had a much larger role in, in heading this off, but I don't think they were inclined to. Can, can, I, can I jump in? And before we get back to answering your question, Yvonne, could I pose a question to Sheena and, and Steve? Sure. Um, you, you both uh, mentioned you know, how, uh, and I think you also mentioned this in one of your questions, Yvonne, that uh, uh, you know, she and, and Putin uh, talked uh, in February. And, you know, we're not exactly sure what they said, of course. Um, and we speculated you know, a little bit on you know, you know, perhaps you know, she didn't get the full story or got a version of the story from Putin, which ended up not being the case. You know, at the same time, you know, we do know that you know, the United States government and the intelligence community, um, which so far as anyone can tell, pretty much got this right this time. Um, you know, they told China, apparently, we've been told, that this was coming down the pike. Um, do we have an idea whether or not a China, you know, believed the U.S. government, and and if they didn't, you know, why might that have been the case? Um, and you know, perhaps now, could you imagine a situation in which they might be scratching their head and saying, okay, this is some put us in a bit of a difficult position. You know, the next time the U.S. government and U.S. intelligence community help, tells us something, maybe we should pay a bit more attention. You know, I was just talking to somebody this morning about that very question, and um, you know, there there is a school of thought that that she got played by Putin um, and that he wasn't clear about his intentions. And when the U S then came and showed them uh, apparently showed them actual satellite uh, photos, or at least described this buildup, which presumably the Chinese themselves could see, they dismissed it. Um, not because, well, I think they dismissed it because they, they just didn't believe the U S I mean, the level of, of trust between these two countries is so low right now that they thought this was just the, the U.S. playing them, um, that, you know, we were trying to sow discord to try to split Russia and China. Um, and and th- for that reason, I think the bias that they brought into the into the calculation when they received this information was, oh, this is just the U.S. and it's fake news. It's disinformation campaign. Uh, and that's why, according to the person I talked to today, that they they just simply didn't believe it. They didn't believe the U.S. And they, I think, tended to believe Putin or at least thought it was the U.S. was exaggerating. It. And that's why I think there is a lot of discomfort that we've seen on the on the Chinese response. Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to speculate what that conversation might or might not have been. Was it kind of a, a partial truth, right? If you read the the reports of um, French President Macron's conversation with Putin today, you know, Macron said to, to Putin, you're deceiving yourself, 
right? We actually, we don't know the extent to which Putin himself is accurately calibrating the situation on the ground in, in Ukraine right now, right? He has this, you know, really long table with advisors who seem to basically tell him things he wants to hear. He has a, a military that um, it appears from what, you know, we've heard on the ground, he didn't really prepare for the political objectives of the military campaign that they were being asked to wage. So you have this pretty serious political military mismatch in, in Russian war fighting strategy right now. Um, you know, which I, you know, again, it's early days. I don't think we've seen how that's going to play out, but it certainly hasn't been sort of the the easy um, sweep that that it, it sounds like, um, you know, people might have have expected both inside Russia and and you know global observers. Um, but I, you know, I think the the question is what lessons China takes away from this. And there's a lesson about the, the credibility of, of US intelligence, right? But it seems to me that in many of the future conversations we could be having, um, China is going to have its own assessments. Um, so in any Taiwan scenario, for example, um, Mason, I, I know you mentioned this a, a minute ago, right? Um, you know, the United States coming to China with information about a, a, a potential looming Taiwan crisis is going to be very different because of China's role in that crisis, right? And similarly with the with anything on the, the Korean peninsula that I could imagine. So I think geography really does matter here. And it just, it's hard for me to see the sort of same types of credibility issues quite coming to play in the same way again in the future. Um, what I think is, is really, you know, China is going to be watching much more going forward is, you know, how, how, what does actually make a country resilient? And how does what we've seen in Ukraine, which is a, a land-based conflict, translate to a maritime scenario, which is what, what they're, they would be concerned about with Taiwan? Um, what is the effect of these sanctions that have been levied on Russia? Um, and how does that affect the Russian economy? What is it that China can do to sort of preemptively insulate itself? Um, to prevent those kinds of impacts from playing out that we're seeing in, in Russia now. Um, you know, so, so, um, so I really think that, that those are things that China is going to be focused on more in a, a forward looking sense. Um, so I think the, the kind of the role of, of U.S. assessments and the, you know, the credibility of the U.S., the United States and China are at a period where the bilateral relationship has very, very low trust. I think there's no question about that. Um, and uh, we could talk a little bit about why that is. But um, but I think the reality is that I, I don't see this necessarily changing that, um, even if you know, the U.S. being, quote unquote, right about this doesn't necessarily repair the, the trust issues that I think exist in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship right now, um, because I think they're just broader and more systemic than than that specific issue that you identified. Um, and I also think the lessons that China is going to be focused on are, are um, sort of a bit more operational, tactical and kind of how to insulate itself and and not make some of the same mistakes going forward. Um, in a you know potential crisis where China has more at risk and more at stake um, and potentially more to gain if it if it handles itself well, um, because presumably some the, some of the situations or scenarios it's thinking about are going to be in China's own backyard. So um, I think those are probably more where I would see the the lessons um, and and China's focus in the future. I don't know if that that answers your question. It's a, a bit of a a bit of a shift, but that's kind of how I, I think about what China is going to be focused on. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it, in many respects, it does. And I guess I would just jump in and piggyback on something you said at the end in terms of China insulating itself. You know, at least at first glance, you know, when we see the response, you know, from from the United States and from Europe and from other countries to isolate um, Russia economically, you know, through, you know, uh, through SWIFT, through export, you know, bans and, you know, asset freezes and, and, and other targeted measures. You know, I can only assume that, again, you know, China has their notebook out and, you know, they're looking at this and, and you know, one can assume that, uh, you know, at least if it looks like over the, you know, next months that this, uh, you know, economic retaliation and this economic isolation, you know, remains in place and doesn't crumble, 
uh, that China is going to accelerate um, its decoupling um, from from the West um, and and from from the U.S. You know, we've talked you know, in some sense quite a bit in the U.S. and in other places about you know the Western world decoupling from China. Maybe China looks at this and they start saying, you know what, maybe we should decouple uh, in, or to the extent that we can as well. Uh, or at least in a targeted way so that we don't make ourselves you know, vulnerable to these types of potential sanctions, you know, in future scenarios where, uh, you know, something you know, parallel to, to what's happened in, in Europe you know, might involve China. That's just a sort of thought that you provoked there. And then the, the operational security point you, you, you pointed out, you know, I think there are some military lessons uh, from this that certainly China and and um and and uh, North Korea would would both look at it, and obviously one of them is logistics. <laughs> um, I don't remember who said this, but someone famously said, "You know, amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics." I don't remember who said that, but you know, it's this sort of you know old you know military um, adage. And you know, certainly, you know, you know, you said, you know, what types of you know, you know, what types of lessons might China be drawing from from Ukraine that can be applied, you know, in a in a maritime uh, situation with respect to Taiwan? You know, obviously the, the logistics are are going to be different there, but you know, presumably they'll take a hard look at and and really you know double down on that and say, okay, like we need to remember if something happens, logistics are, are critical. Uh, and then this sort of trade off between operational security um, and preparation, like it seemed like in some way, maybe Russia wanted to keep the operational security um, you know, really high. And so they didn't inform necessarily even their own officers, much less the, the actual soldier, soldiers on the ground about what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, the, you need some preparation time in order to actually, you know, instill in your, in your troops and your officers, why it is that they're going to go into conflict. Um, and so I, I think this operational security versus, you know, preparation time issues, I think kind of an interesting one as well. Sorry about that. I, I hijacked your, I hijacked your question, Yvonne, and in a minute we can get back to it, but it seems like you had something. Can I just, can I just add two quick points there that I think are relevant for, for China? I mean, first of all, what we're seeing here in some ways is the the pathologies of personalist rule, right? The the idea that Putin has concentrated power so much in a single leader. That's a system of government that we know has some real drawbacks in terms of the, the their ability to get unbiased, accurate information. Um, and uh, that those systems tend to mess around with military services for political purposes and regime or leader security purposes in ways that have detrimental effects on war fighting. And I think we've seen both of those dynamics at play um, in this conflict. Um, I don't know that that's going to cause China to rethink its own sort of concentration of personal power in Xi Jinping. My suspicion is no, it will continue to do that. Um, but I think uh, this is this is one case where those those pathologies are playing out very clearly. And then just a point on the, you know, um, China watching the sanctions. Right. So so we already know that this is something China is concerned about because it has, um, you know, considered legislation on countering foreign sanctions already. Um, and so what we've seen is attention to that already on the part of the Chinese leadership. Um, but now what, what we've seen is a round of sanctions that goes far beyond, you know, the types of sanctions that China has experienced and navigated with North Korea. And the reality is that, that, that China is far more economically sort of dependent and tied to the United States, Europe and the Western world um, than it is to Russia. And so in some ways, this is a, you know, a really interesting lesson with much lower stakes um, on sort of what the, you know, the impact of, of that interdependence is. So I, I do think there's going to be some attention to decoupling and, and in particular, um, the, the things, the ways in which China might try to preemptively decouple um, to limit the damage of the, of the kind that we're seeing from the forced decoupling that, that Russia is currently undergoing. Well, Yang Jun, would you have any final comments on, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I think that this Ukraine case is a very a strong lesson for the, uh, uh, some countries, especially North Korea or Iran, because of, as you remember, uh, foreign policy journal debate uh, uh, is famous about the uh, Ukraine having nuclear weapons or Ukraine uh, without nuclear weapons. Uh, John Mia Scheimer and Stephen Walsh uh, in, in the 1990, at the, uh, when Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, John Mia Scheimer support Ukraine with the uh, nuclear weapon because of a Russian possible invasion. Now it's a uh, lesson to the North Korea Keeping up nuclear weapons will be another Libya, another Ukraine uh, will be there. Uh, 
uh, destination for North Korea, even Iran. So another question is for the South Korean and Taiwan, this kind of a small nation of the, uh, the U.S. alliances uh, fear about actual U.S. military uh, uh, support when uh, the, the crisis happened. So Ukraine now is so another signal, Syria under the Obama administration for the uh, different region. But anyway, uh, Biden did not send the trip troops uh, to the Ukraine and the uh, Obama did not send the troops to Syria. Yeah, we know the Ukraine is not a NATO member, not a European Union member, but anyway, uh, the uh, to South Korean people about their own uh, aspiration for nuclear weapons even, or their own uh, self-defense capabilities, uh, very strong uh, lesson from the Ukraine invasion is uh, as to the different country takes different lessons from these uh, cases. That's my final comment. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm sure that you guys would love to just go on, but unfortunately the time's up. So uh, we must end here. And thank you again, Sheena, Youngjun, Steve, and Mason uh, for joining us today. And um, I'll see you guys soon. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mason, Steve, Sheena.